Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Tim Moen Show. Thank you for joining me. It's always a pleasure to have you here. I hope you're doing fantastic. I hope uh, state isn't bothering you too much today. Hope you can find it in your heart to have a great day, despite all the fuckery going on in the world and in the state. Listen, I uh, decided I'm going to start a new segment. I want to know how you guys like this. I'm just going to kind of review last week's news or some of the things that stood out to me, let you know my thoughts. If you think there are any news stories, clips, uh, things going on that uh, you want me to comment on, drop a comment down in the comment section below. Send me an email. Uh, also, if you think I should have any guests on, if you think any you'd like to hear me interview someone, uh, please feel free. My email is uh, down in the comment section or down in the show notes section. Feel free to uh, drop me a line. I'm gonna. I'd love to hear your thoughts. I'd love to know what you guys want to hear. Talk to me, people. Talk to me. Communication is so important in a relationship. And, uh, you know, I love you guys. So talk to me. Anyways, um, let's talk about uh, what's what, what's been going on last week. The, the liberals and the progressives were literally gushing over this clip uh, that went viral of Trudeau taking on this uh, supposed PPC supporter. And uh, it was something to watch. Uh, let's let's watch it now, actually, and I'll, I'll add my comments here. Our dental program uh, that is going to help low-income families be able to send their kids to the dentist. Would you support that? Um, for, I, I'm not fully into it. I just know. Well, you, you don't. All right, right there, we know that he's he's not a supporter of the Libertarian Party because the Libertarian Party supporter was said, "No, I'm not for that. I don't I don't believe in uh, using violence to uh, solve problems." Um, you know, I'll, I support low income uh, access to dentists because, uh, you know, my family doesn't make as much money as me. My kids don't make as much money as me. My, uh, you know, my n nephew doesn't make as much money as me. So, yeah, I'll give them access to dentists, but uh, I won't force you to pay them to or pay for their dentistry. That's what something a libertarian might say. But uh, this guy's kind of like, yeah, I think I, I, I agree with that. Think I, I'm pretty sure I'm against Wait, abortion. Hang on, hang on. We'll put that aside for yeah, a second. Yeah. You don't think low-income families should have access to dental care? Uh, Again, the answer here should be uh, not at the point of a gun. No, I, I don't think other people should be. Uh, you know, the question to throw back to Trudeau might be something like, do you believe that uh, violence is the only way to get poor people access to dental care? Do you think that, uh, what, what do you think should happen to me, Mr. Trudeau, if I don't want to support this program? If I don't want to pay, should I be shot? Well, if the answer is no, then why did you support, why did you vote in favor of this policy that says I should be shot if I don't support uh, low-income dental care, if, if my tax dollars don't go to that, if I'm not extorted and, <laughs> you know, um, again, this is, you know, this is kind of day one liberty stuff, but, you know, what, what happened here and why this clip I think went viral is that uh, it, it was a golden opportunity, right? Obviously, um, this young man here who's who's videotaping Trudeau on his phone, you can clearly see that. We we don't see his video or the context that led up to this. We don't know why this guy, kid's here. We don't know if he's a liberal plant. We don't know if he's just a, a, a cocky kid who thinks he's going to stump Trudeau with some right-wing talking points or some, you know... Um, I got give him like a gotcha moment or something like that. Uh, but what we do know is that someone is videotaping this interaction and this was a golden interaction. If you are a progressive, because here you make this right wing, uh, presumably populist kid look like a complete moron. And that's going to bode well for, for the progressive brand, because of course the progressive brand is, uh, populists are morons. And they're beneath our dignity and they ought to be removed from polite society and, you know, all the sort of thing. And, um, uh, and, and progressives are the smart intellectual caring and rational people here. Uh, that's, that's the kind of message that, that progressives fucking love. Right. All right. Let, let's keep going with this. Uh, yeah. so I think they should. You think they should? Yeah. Just... Okay. Well, I think they should. Well, yeah. I mean, that, when the question's phrased that way, uh, do you think poor people should be able to eat? Do you think they should be able to eat? Huh? Well, yeah, of course they should be able to eat. Yeah. Yeah. 
that that's not the question though when we're talking about government policy it's do you think people should have to feed them at the point of a gun do you think that people should be killed for not feeding them that's the question right that's the basic question and that that's a very different conversation to have than the one being had here should nice things happen or do you think bad things should happen that's essentially what the level of the conversation trudeau's bringing uh here is and the kids the kids falling into the traps like yeah i think nice things should happen oh well did you know that uh uh you, you're the people you support support bad things they're here probably having the conservative party voted against that okay, okay. Oh, they hate, they support bad things. They don't support good things. They, they're they bad people. Well, you're, you seem like a good kid. You like good things to happen. So why don't you support good things? Okay, so that's, so already you see the party you support, <laughs> the party you support <laughs> yeah, yeah. doesn't, I'm not doesn't concerned. support you. I'm more PPC. I'm not more really PPC. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so why is that? Why are you PPC? I didn't know you are mostly Christian. I think I'm against the vaccine. Okay, he's mostly Christian. I'm not sure what how that has to do with the PPC. Uh, you know, Bernier, uh, the guy who owns the PPC, that started the PPC, that the PPC wouldn't exist without. Um, not a Christian. I see no signs of that. You know, like, yeah. So I'm not sure where you're getting this. I mean, maybe, kid, you should be supporting the Christian Heritage Party if, if Christianity is your thing, but. Yeah, let's see. Yeah, okay, so mostly Christian, so so you don't think we should be supporting Muslims? No, I think I'm supporting. Okay, that's uh, that's an interesting comment there by Trudeau, right? I mean, he clearly equates being Christian with being anti everything else, right? He and here's a guy who, um, you know, would would not like if if this kid said, "Well, I support, um, I, I support the PPC because I'm Muslim." Trudeau, do you think Trudeau would say, what? Oh, you, you're a Muslim. Oh, do, you support him because you're Muslim. Oh, well, does that mean you're anti-Christian? Does that mean you hate Christians? You don't want Christians in this country? But of course, Trudeau would never say that because um, he's he's actually anti-Christian, right? He sees Christians in the same way he sees populists, that they are not fit for polite society, that they are not fit, that they're dimwits, that they are... Uh, tearing our country down, that they're bigoted, that they're misogynistic, that they are, um, you know, that they're everything that's wrong with with Canada. So, um, you know, he would never, you know, if this kid said, I support the PPC because I'm Muslim, you would never hear out of Trudeau's mouth, why are you anti-Christian then? Does that mean you're anti-Christian? Is that why you support the PPC? No. But, uh, of course, he goes there in this way. Now, the kid, uh, presumably... Um, maybe, you know, again, I'm not sure what the PPC has to do with Christianity other than I, I know that some of their big supporters are Christian. Like there's uh Laura Lynn, I can't remember her name, that Laura Lynn Thompson, I think her name is, she's used to be a news or anchor or something. She's very, uh, like 100 Huntley street kind of Christian. Um, you, you get the impression that she should be doing, a like a Christian, um, uh, morning show or something like that the kind that my mom always used to have on tv but you know other than that it's not clear to me um why he would why you would automatically support the ppc because you're christian but everyone. you should support I think, everyone i think mainly liberal abortion is against christianity i think a lot but, of but okay okay do you think do you think that okay so he's he's saying he it seems to be his thing is abortion right so christianity abortion while the ppc um, Max has basically said, um, his party, his, his members can vote their conscience. He doesn't have a party line on abortion. So there's no official stance on abortion in the PPC, but at least they, they're letting their members of parliament vote their consciousness. Now, again, if he were truly anti-abortion, if he thought that abortion was the biggest thing, biggest sin and biggest political point, he should support a party that is against abortion like maybe the christian heritage party again if he's a christian and he's against abortion you know why, why not and those are your most important things why not support a party that most closely aligns with your values but women should have the right to choose what happens to their own bodies personally no you no know, you think you think you should be able to choose what happens personally no i don't think women should have to <laughs> okay so th this kid is not he's not um 
he's not prepared for the abortion debate, right? He he probably doesn't have a good um, rational reason for his position. And by that, I mean, look, you can have a rational reason on either side or that there's actually many sides to the abor- abortion debate. You can have a rational, uh, well, a- a be able to make an argument all along that spectrum, a well-reasoned one, but this kid clearly doesn't even have that. He doesn't have um, a well reason because because he's automatically going to, a woman shouldn't have a choice. Well, he should be reframing this debate to um, that woman, that that female person in the womb uh, should have a right to her body. She should have a choice, shouldn't she? Like, sh- shouldn't she have a choice to live? Uh, just because she's, you know, something like that. But uh, of course, he's, he's fallen right into Trudeau's traps here. Uh, every single one so far. To a woman's body? Well, I think if they're sleeping around, they shouldn't be allowed to right. abort the baby person. Okay, another. Now he sets himself up to be demolished, right? Because if they're sleeping around, they shouldn't. They shouldn't have a choice. So, so the reason they should have to to bear this pregnancy isn't because there's a life in there that is worth protecting. It's because they 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 have to suffer the consequences of their decision. They, you know, they, they've been sluts. Therefore, you know, they don't get a free pass here. Okay. Well, um, what about that life in there? I mean, does that have <laughs> my bike come into play at all that you want to protect that life? Um, anyway, so let's keep going. I'm wow. pro-choice. Wow. wow. Oh, wait, you just saying you're pro-choice. No, 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 no. You're pro-choice. No, 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 no you're not pro-choice. No, I'm pro, what's the place? Pro-life. pro-life. Okay, pro-life. Yeah, he doesn't even know, he doesn't even know what position are, you know, so it's hard to know whether this is just some dim-witted kid who's, um, you know, had a few late night discussions about politics with his frat brothers over some beers where they thought they've, you know, solved the mysteries of the universe. And look, when I was a young kid, I, I thought I had it all figured out too and uh, solved a lot of things. And, you know, th- it, it's clear this kid has never, ever been challenged on his political beliefs. It's either that or um, or he's he's a liberal plant. I don't know. And and you don't think women should be able to make choices what they do with their bodies? With abortion, no, personally, no. Why not? Why not? Uh, because there's their choice to sleep around. They have to... No. Whoa, 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 whoa. That's- yeah, they have to suffer the consequences of their choice. That seems to be his argument against abortion. Nothing to do with protect that uh, that life in there. This is what what makes me kind of think he might be a liberal plant because, you know, usually the pro life position is that life is precious in there. That life, no matter what, d- doesn't deserve this. Even if that that their mom's a whore, or even if that mom was raped, I mean, why why would that have anything to do with that innocent child in there? That's what a typical pro-life person would argue um, in this case, but this kid is arguing that, well, she's a slut, therefore she deserves to have to bear a child. And, um, you know, that, that is, that sounds like a cartoon version of what a liberal thinks the pro-life position is, right? I mean, if you're a liberal like, like Trudeau, you might think that's how pro-life people think that they, they look down on women and they think that they need to be controlled and bear the consequences of their actions and stuff. When of course the real, animating factor behind being pro-life um, from all the pro-life people I've met is they really, really don't want that life to be killed. They, they want that life to be preserved. It has nothing to do with punishing mom. In fact, a lot of these pro-life people go out of their way and try to find ways to support mom. And, you know, yeah, you made a mistake, but that's okay. You've got a precious life inside you. Let us help you. Let us, um, support you and you know that sort of thing but anyways that is oh so 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 a, a woman who is raped should be able to get that, an abortion uh i'd say that sure that's where it gets complicated we're no no it doesn't get complicated but that's like exactly, yes or no that's she's super specific examples like well, no, no no but it's it's an all too common example like if right you, women get raped all the time yeah yeah yeah. okay and it's it's something we have to take seriously yeah. but 95 so, so no no so let's talk. again this kid is is ill informed and ill prepared uh, or just doesn't know the the pro life position and the arguments that that many pro lifers have made. He's he's either just uh, you know you know had some beers with his frat brothers and been like oh yeah you know men are so so oppressed it's bullshit and and uh, yeah those you know they they're generally inclined to 
like the message of, of the Andrew Tates and the Jordan Petersons of the world because uh, they, they are articulating something that they feel is missing, right? And so they're like, yeah, but but they have no philosophical grounding. They have no grounding at all. Uh, they, they've never, you know, experienced um, actual arguments. And I mean, Trudeau isn't isn't any kind of skilled orator or debater or anything like that. Well, I, I shouldn't say that. He's he's a skilled rhetorician. By that I mean he knows how to uh, to avoid talking about the meat of the matter. He knows how to come off sounding great, right? He's great at virtue signaling, but he's not so good at the actual virtue itself. And, um, you know, so, but, but this kid is, is not prepared at all to, for this. And you can tell he, he just hasn't really been challenged or thought deeply on any of these issues. You know, again, the, the, the issue about, um, from a pro-life perspective is that, uh, you know, it, it's not that child's fault how it was brought into the world. You don't kill kids. Like, you know, if the kid wanted to be funny, he'd go back to Trudeau and say, say, yeah, absolutely. You know, like a woman shouldn't have to bear a rape child. In fact, um, you know, any, any woman that's the mother of a rape kid, I, I think kill all the kids, you know, all of them. Like uh, she shouldn't have to use her. It's her body, her choice. She shouldn't have to use her body to look after them and cook for them and go to work for them and you know all that kind of thing so just kill them kill them all if they were raped all all, all children that were byproducts of rape yeah I, I agree with you Trudeau kill them kill them all what about that specific example should a woman who was raped be able to get an abortion uh, yeah Trudeau I think uh, she should be able to get an abortion in fact I think she should be able to kill all her kids you know she shouldn't be forced to be a mom to them. I mean, you know, the ravages of how hard it is on that woman to care for those little buggers. Um, yeah. And she didn't want them. She didn't ask for them. She was raped. So kill all the rape kids. Put on it, 50, 50. I think well, 95, you are, you are, you are not in favor of saying yes, a woman who was raped should get, uh, should be able to choose uh, to not bear that child. Uh, but uh, I honestly don't know. Well, it sounds like you need to do a little more thinking yeah, and, and a little more praying on it as well. <laughs> a little more praying. That, uh, that, and that's where I mean he's he's a good uh, good rhetorician, right? He's good at rhetorical devices. Uh, I mean, that, that was a, a perfect snippet right there. And a little more praying, right? Maybe you should pray a little bit more about how you treat women and how you think of Muslims and how you... Um, yeah, you, you, you know, and and whether you support access to dental care by low income families and all these kinds of things. It seems to me, young man, that you support all the bad things. And what you want to do, if you're a good Christian boy, is support all the good things. You know, like a woman's right to choose. We respect women, and you know, blah blah blah. Anyways, um, yeah, progressives are are. Uh, predictably gushing over that one. And, um, uh, you know, basically what we have is, and, and what they're gushing over, what they're praising and what they're basking in. And this is where we're at in politics today is that this midwit called Trudeau, uh, has demolished a dimwit, right? Some dimwitted kid who wasn't, uh, wasn't at all prepared for any of any of what just happened, but, uh, there we go. All right, let's move on to the next clip um oh this one's this one's good this is elon musk um giving it to a bbc reporter so elon musk um had a bbc reporter in to talk about all things twitter a lot of things that are going on right now in the twitterverse um that there is a in, in most countries twitter puts a tag on uh government funded or government controlled media with a warning saying this is government controlled so so for example that tag was slapped on npr national public radio in the states um Paul Iver in canada here is asking twitter to slap that tag on the cbc and of course progressives are are <laughs> getting uh bent out of shape about this and and so you know that i think kind of set the context for why the bbc came in but you know musk to his credit said well look i'm only going to have the bbc come in if uh, i can do this on uh 
broadcast it in real time on Twitter spaces or whatever the Twitter broadcast thing is. Um, and so, you know, he, he opened up because most people don't see how the sausage is made in the media. Right. And so this was kind of brilliant on must part. Like I I've been, uh, on, on the inside of the media where they're asking you questions and then they snip things out of context and they always have a narrative to spin. In fact, I've actually been, when I was a, uh, a video production guy I had a video production business. Uh, I would often get called by news outlets like global and CBC to, to go capture the news that was breaking in my community. They didn't have a dedicated reporter in my community. So they contract me to go gather stuff and they would often have a, a spin on things. Right. So for example, there was uh, there was one incident. So I remember in Fort McMurray where there was, uh, there was some shooting, that happened um, in in this one community called Abbasan. There's one road in and one road out, and um, the cops were doing a manhunt for the shooter. And so they had a roadblock set up on this one road in, one road out, while they were conducting the search in this community of Abbasan. And you know, CBC directed me, said very clearly, uh, we're, we're hearing that the the police are imposing this draconian lockdown and keeping citizens. So we want you to cover that angle. So they, they have an angle that they want you to cover. They have a spin, right? And, and the spin here is that cops are bad. Uh, you know, cops are evil or whatever. And therefore we need to do, we need you to do what makes them look bad. We need you to focus on um, the story here of them inconveniencing people. It wasn't like they were even um, like locking people in their community. They were letting them leave, but it was like, let me just check your vehicle to make sure there isn't a gunman hiding in your in your trunk or something like that. So, you know, media always has this agenda. It always has this angle. It always has, um, and it's always kind of like an establishment angle, right? And so whenever you see a news story, it's always clips and they're, they're all patched together to make uh, a narrative, right? They're brought out of context, that sort of thing. And what Musk has done here is said, you're going to get to see the whole context. You're going to get to see how the, how the sausage is made here. And so there's a moment that happens in this interview and it's just over an hour. If you want to watch the whole thing, uh, you can find it on YouTube. Uh, there's a few minutes in here where you would never hear about this uh, couple minute exchange that is about that you're about to witness um in the news the media itself would never report on an exchange like this so let's watch what uh, elon had to say hateful thing yeah i mean you know just content that will solicit a, a reaction something that may include something that is slightly racist or slightly sexist those kinds of those kinds of things so you think if I'm, something is slightly sexist it should be banned I, no, is that I'm, what you're saying? I'm not saying anything. I'm saying. Well, I'm just curious. What you, I'm, I'm trying to understand what you mean by hateful con content. And I'm asking for specific. Now, notice here, this, this reporter is, you could tell his mouth is starting to get dry. He's, he's not used to having pushback, right? He's used to the establishment echo chamber of, yeah, obviously this is hateful. And obviously this is sexist or at least slightly sexist. And it is because we say so. Like they, they, they're never ever challenged on this stuff like how is it sexist how is it hateful how is it racist like how how for example is a MAGA supporter saying they want uh they want tighter immigration controls bigoted how is it racist explain that to me it's just automatically assumed that it is racist of course it's racist because they don't want brown people coming in um and, and so so it, it they have this sort of arrogance and condescension about them that you know, like obviously there's racist and you know this right elon and elon's like no okay, give me an example examples um and if and you just said that if something is slightly sexist that's hateful and by the way that the last clip i had of trudeau versus this kid if that could be labeled midwit versus dimwit this one could be labeled um a smart person versus midwit content does that mean that it should be banned well you've asked me you've asked me whether my feed whether it's got less or more it, i'd say it's got slightly more that's but, why i'm asking for examples 
Can, right. you, can you name one example? I, I honestly don't use. I, I, honestly, I you don't. You can't name I, a single example. I'll tell you why, because I don't actually use that for you feed anymore, because I, I just don't particularly like it. But you and said actually, a lot of people. A lot of people are quite similar. I, I, I only. Well, I only well, look well, at hang my, on a second. My you said you've seen more hateful content, but you can't name a single example. Not even one. I'm not sure I've used that feed for the last three or four weeks. And I, well, I, then I how did you see that hateful content? content? Because I've been I've been using I've been using Twitter since you've taken it over for the last six months. Okay, so then you must have at some point seen the you for you hateful content. I'm asking for one example. Right. Oh man, this guy is looking for an exit so hard. He doesn't want this this uh, line of conversation to continue at all. And and you I, can't I, give us a single one. And, and, and I'm saying I, I, then I, I say so that you don't know what you're talking about. Really? Yes, because you can't give me a single example. Really? You don't think I know what I'm talking about? You don't think I, uh, an establishment reporter, someone who's been vetted and who is in a respected field and has never been challenged and is always right, you think that I, I am wrong here? Hateful con content, not even one tweet. And yet you claimed that the hateful content was high. Well, that's a false. No, what I claimed... You just lied. What, no, no, what I claimed was... Uh, there are many uh, organizations that say that that. Oh, I don't say it. Other people say it. Other people are saying it. Other people say <laughs> that's a, a nice uh, sidestep. Kind of information is on the rise now. Whether whether it has a my feed one or example. not. I mean, I, right? And Literally, if you, you look at something one. like the, the uh, Strategic Dialogue uh, Institute in the, in the UK, they will say that. So you, they, look, it's, people will say all sorts of nonsense. I'm literally asking for a right. single example, and you can't name one. Right. And as, as I've already said, I don't use that feed. But let's, well, then how let, would you know? That I don't you, think this is getting anywhere. You literally said you experienced more hateful content, and then couldn't name a single example. Right. And as I said, I that's absurd. I haven't. I haven't actually looked at that feed. I then how would you know this hateful content? Because I'm saying that's what I saw a few weeks ago. I can't give you an exact example. Let's move on. We have. We only have a certain amount of time. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, really wants to be... Oh man, too funny. He he really wanted out of that conversation, didn't he? Yeah. The um, he couldn't give an example. Um, what did he say at the end there? Um, like the, just the sheer arrogance, right? And and being called out for it. Um, this reporter has again has never been challenged, you know, in his views. He's never thought very deeply about him. And and this is the difference between, uh, uh, you know, I guess a midwit and what I would call uh, an intelligent person, someone who has some intelligent like intelligence like musk who's thought deeply about it again it, and, it, and it was very similar to that last conversation between uh trudeau and and the kid there the kid was very dim-witted right like he and and not to say that he's not smart or not intelligent he's he's just uh clearly impulsive um hadn't thought things through uh ha has never had his beliefs seriously challenged and when he comes up against a midwit like Trudeau, it gets absolutely destroyed. But also Trudeau is a midwit and not highly intelligent because he's never had to have his beliefs seriously examined before. He's never, you know, he's surrounded by yes men. He's surrounded by people that love him. And all he has to do is put on an irk, act, be virtuous. He's, he's essentially kind of like an AI or a, an NPC, a non-player character in a way. And I met these guys before I met, you know, I worked with Neil Young and, and they're surrounded by this bubble of people who tell them they can do no wrong that, um, you know, constantly solve the ego. If, if their feelings get hurt or if someone ever does come at them with a, a reasonable argument or challenges their, their underlying assumptions and beliefs in any meaningful way, they shrink back from it and they're immediately surrounded by a horde of yes men who say no no that person's evil they're wrong that's a disgusting person don't feel bad blah 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 and you know pretty soon you're like oh okay yeah i'm feeling pretty good i'm feeling pretty good about myself here um you know that the uh and, the, and so they, they never have to go to that kind of long dark night of the soul where they're like jesus i was so wrong about that god damn i gotta i gotta get my shit together i gotta make sure i'm never wrong about something like that again about that serious i'm gonna make sure you know, I have good reasons to believe what I believe. And, you know, you could just tell that that none of these people uh, have have ever other than Musk have ever been um, have ever had to go there. And Musk would have had to go there as an entrepreneur, right? Because entrepreneurs, they they have to face cold, hard reality all the time. 
you know, they, they have no protective filter around them or protective bubble of yes men because the people that have that protective bubble of yes men telling them you telling you you can do no wrong they don't succeed on their own merits right they, they can't so um so anyways now <clears throat> i've when watching this reporter um and and just my interactions with reporters it made me remember this clip this old noam chomsky clip where he's actually talking to a bbc reporter and Noam is explaining to this gobsmacked reporter how it is that the media uh, is, is never really challenges the establishment and it always kind of follows the party line and um, is, is a, basically a cheerleader for the establishment and why it never is anti-establishment, right? And, um, and so let, let's watch that clip now. Um, and, and look, Noam Chomsky and I would have a lot of disagreements. Um, he's on the opposite end of the political spectrum, I think, for me. Uh, he's, he's an avowed leftist. He might even be communist. Uh, but he has written some good stuff on um, on how, on, on the purpose of the media in our status system, right? On how it manufactures consent, on how it's a cheerleader for the establishment and how it promotes the establishment, keeps us all kind of enslaved. So if you ever want to, delve into that stuff. I highly recommend Manufacturing Consent by Noam Chomsky, but here's a clip of Chomsky um, kind of explaining to a gobsmacked reporter how this all happens. Um, tell me how that works. Is the, You're not suggesting that um, proprietors phone one another up or that many journalists get their copy spiked, as we say? It's um, actually Orwell, <clears throat> you may recall, has a... Right, so, so the reporter is saying here... Um, look, Chomsky, you're not saying, you're, are, are you trying to tell me that, uh, that, you know, a call comes down from head office and they say, kill that, kill that article. We can't have that put out or, um, or that, uh, there's threats being made against journalists saying, Hey, you better censor that or there's going to be hell to pay. No, no, it's, it's much more subtle than that as Chomsky is going to explain. Essay called literary censorship in England which was supposed to be the introduction to Animal Farm, except that it never appeared, in which he points out, look, I'm writing about a totalitarian society, but in free democratic England, it's not all that different. And then he says, uh, uh, unpopular ideas can be silenced without any force. And then he, how, how? he gives, two, he gives a two-sentence response, which is not very profound, but captures it. He says two reasons. First, the press is owned by wealthy men who have every interest in not having certain things appear, but second, the whole educational system from the beginning on through just ex gets you to understand that there are certain things you just don't say. Well, spelling these things out, that's perfectly correct. I mean, there, it's the first sentence is what we expand this on. Is, this is what I don't get, because it, it suggests that, I mean, I'm a joke, people like me are self-censoring. No, not self-censoring. Right. Uh, there's a filtering system that starts in kindergarten, it goes all the way through, uh, and it it's not doesn't work a hundred percent, but it pretty effective. Uh, it selects for obedience and subordination, uh, and especially I think that so, so, so stroppy people won't make it to positions of influence. Behavior problems, or if you read uh, applications to a graduate school, you see that people will tell you he's not uh, he doesn't get along too well with his colleagues. You, you know how to interpret those things. I, I I'm just right. So so what. Chomsky's insight is here is that look from K to K to 12 and even beyond the system is filtering for obedience compliance um, uh, support for the establishment support for uh, real you know what a libertarian would say support for the state support for statism because um, of course these are government schools they're government curriculums they're publicly funded they of course they're going to support the power structures um, and 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 so uh, he's saying, look, it's it's not that um, these these power brokers are calling up reporters and saying, shut that story down or do this or do that. It's it, he's saying that you, you don't get to be successful in this system unless you are an establishment shill, unless you are really good at supporting. And it goes all the way up to grad school. In other words, you're not going to become a professor or you know, be, be tenured and, and even go into graduate school and get these graduate spots, uh, prestigious graduate spots, uh, unless you are, 
uh, an obedient, compliant, um, you know, uh, establishment, uh, <laughs> establishment knob polisher, basically. It's interesting is because <clears throat> I was brought up like a lot of people, um, probably post the Watergate film and so on, to believe that journalism was a crusading uh, craft and that there were a lot of um, disputatious, stroppy, difficult people in journalism. And I have to say, I think I know some of them. Well, I know some of the best and best known investigative reporters in the United States. I won't mention names, but I'm like, whose attitude toward the media is much more cynical than mine. In fact, <clears throat> they regard the media as a sham. And they know and they consciously talk about how they try to play it like a violin. If they see a little opening, they'll try to squeeze something in that ordinarily wouldn't make it through. Yeah, so there Chomsky is talk, uh, addressing this point that the reporter brings up that, hey, look, I know some very disagreeable reporter that, you know, investigative journalists that are anti-establishment. Uh, but Chomsky points out that, look, yes, there are some of those. And, you know, and clearly if you're a bright person and you're in this system, you're going to see it for what it is. You're going to notice eventually that, hey, no one is covering this very important story or this very important perspective on a story and we need to do something about that but they're also going to recognize because they're smart that if i publish that i'm likely to lose my job and so he says he the the, the smarter ones play it like a violin right like they're they're looking for the little moments where they can drop in uh a story kind of on the sly without the establishment noticing it and and get their news across so the, the idea of incrementalism right that this is the the argument libertarians always hear about why uh we should run for like mainstream parties like the cpc or something like that uh because you know like get in there and actually like run for a party that actually has a chance of winning because then you can make some changes from within. It's called incrementalism. It's like, yeah, you, you're not going to be able to come out and say taxation is theft or, or like talk about the reality that we're living on essentially a slave plantation, but you can find, you can play it like a Stradivarius, right? Like move with it and find little moments to have a little bit of influence in the system. Well, you know, obviously you guys know my thoughts on that. It doesn't work. You know, you can't change the system from within. It's it's uh, um, it needs to be changed from without uh, by dissidents. And but uh, you know, Chomsky is is pointing out to this guy that look, you, you're you know these dissident reporters or these these reporters are dropping it. You know, they're dropping in little things that they think they can get away with, but they're not going to go much further than that because they want to keep their jobs. Uh, and it's perfectly true that the majority, I'm, I'm sure you're speaking for the majority of journalists who are trained, have it driven into their heads that this is a crusading uh, profession, adversarial, we stand up against power, a very self-serving view. Uh, on the other hand, in my opinion, I hate to make a value judgment, but the better journalists, and in fact the ones who are often regarded as the best journalists, have quite a different picture. Right. So, so what he, what he's pointing out here is that, look, look, bud, I know you think you're a crusader and adversarial. This is a story that you journalists all tell yourself that you are standing up against the establishment. This is what's drilled into you by the establishment. Yes. You're anti-establishment. You're anti-establishment. You're challenging the establishment. You're freedom fighters. You're, you know, revolutionaries while all the, all the while they are really the establishment itself. Right. But uh, it's a it's a self-serving story, as Chomsky points out, to tell yourself that you're fighting for what's right and what's free uh, while you're actually doing the bidding of of the establishment and evil. Right. I think a very realistic one. How, how can you how can you know that I'm self-censoring? How can you I know that you're self-censoring? I'm sure you believe everything you're saying. But what I'm saying is, if you believe something different, you wouldn't be sitting where you're sitting. <laughs> Mike Jopp. Yeah, that, that, that's exactly it. Again, um, these people are sitting in those seats uh, for a reason, right? And it's not because they're censoring themselves. Maybe, maybe some of the best journalists out there, the, the ones that have actually had their eyes open, had the scales peel back from their eyes and can see the matrix and they're, they're red-pilled or whatever, that are still in the establishment. Maybe these people are, um, you know, self-censoring because if, if they they know if they they were to speak truth to power they'd end up like a 
Glenn Greenwald or Edward Snowden or Julian Assange, I guess, would be probably the best example, uh, be on the outs uh, for for speaking the truth, right? So, uh, so again, the the people that are established, the, the, are, are are most in line with the establishments, are the ones that get those seats, and not only are they most in line with the establishment, but they also think that they're uh, crusaders and adversarial crusaders challenging the establishment when really, no, they've been selected because of their ability to think, tell themselves that helpful story while never, it would never, never pop into their brains to challenge the establishment in any meaningful way, because that's outside their realm of thinking. Like they, they just, their mind just doesn't go there. Like you, you would never hear someone uh, challenge Trudeau, for example, like you'd never hear a member of the press gallery say, hey, uh, taxation is taking without consent. How do you justify that in your mind? How do you sleep at night? How do you, you know, you would never hear a reporter say that uh, because it would never, ever occur to him. The, the type of person that it would occur to, a guy like me, would never, ever get those jobs to begin with, right? So the only people that are getting those jobs are the people that have the narrowest uh, establishment views, but also think that they're being very adversarial and like, uh, you know, holding, <laughs> speaking truth to power or something like that. Um, and, and yeah, I mean, we, we see what happens to journalists that actually challenge the establishment and break meaningful news. Um, well, Julian Assange, again, best example, you know, with WikiLeaks showing us, you know, the, the Chelsea Manning, uh, videos that, that he, that uh, he leaked or she leaked. I don't know. I guess it was a he at the time, but it's a she now. So was it a she when, when it was leaked or a he, when he was leaked? I don't, I don't understand. Anyways, um, <laughs> that, that video showed the U S killing civilians with their gunships and, you know, kind of gloating about it. Um, there was all sorts of evil that was, that was, and what happened to Julian Assange? He got, exiled, locked down, faced with criminal charges. What happened to Snowden? What, you know, he wasn't a journalist, but uh, the journalist he gave all his information to, Glenn Greenwald, uh, didn't last in the establishment very long after that information was brought to light. I mean, these are our journalists that actually dig and speak truth to power, and they don't last in corporate establishment jobs very long. And, you know, this isn't, this might be a topic for another another time but but we see that throughout um throughout corporate and government bureaucracies the that the most important thing for success is agreeableness to the establishment right that you are that you are willing to go along with the establishment and and never do anything innovative never do anything ch that challenges it never do anything um that might be moral or just if it, it challenges the establishment, those thoughts would never occur to you. And so, uh, you know, it's very difficult for people who are um, innovators, anti-establishment. Um, and I mean, this is in one way what makes Elon Musk so remarkable is he clearly is anti-establishment in a lot of ways, uh, but he's just uh, built his way faster than the establishment could tear him down. And, you know, he's had some establishment help as well. I won't say that he hadn't, like he certainly has played he used the establishment when he needed to, or when it benefited him. Um, you know, he got all sorts of subsidies and public funds for Tesla, for example, but I mean, don't hate the player, hate the game. You know, the game is, um, corporatocracy. And so, uh, you know, maybe the best thing to do is be really good at playing the establishment corporatocracy, corporatocracy game and get a, as much money as you can of uh and as much benefit and then use all that benefit and power and money that you've achieved to uh to fight to, to change the game to change the nature of the game i don't know if that's what must doing uh but it was a pleasure to see him take down that bbc reporter that pompous midwit and um yeah what what we need is uh, someone like musk on the political stage who can do the same thing to Justin Trudeau. Unfortunately, you're never going to see me on there, so you're not likely to see anyone take down Justin Trudeau the way I think I could. But anyways, guys, that's it for uh, today. Hope you enjoyed that. Leave a comment below. If you think there's any other clips or new stories I should cover uh, for this next week, 
uh, let me know and I will take a look at them and add them to the next broadcast. Thank you so much. See you next time.